Thank you very much. So as you said, today I'm going to talk about um, um, something that's closely related to my current research, uh, closely related to the book that I'm writing. Uh, and, and before I start, let me just uh, point out that um, these are some of my, I don't know, just this, this camera, yeah. Um, these are some of my or so examples of sources I work with, especially Werkzeitungen, factory newspapers uh, that were printed by the companies uh, for their employees, um, sometimes with uh, uh, quite uh, a high circulation. Uh, uh, this one is another example from uh, BASF. I'm going to talk about BASF in a little while. Um, these are other things uh, from the press at the time talking about unemployment. Uh, basically, unemployment uh, 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 was a major issue around 1950 in West Germany, and that's um, pretty much what, what is at the heart of the forgotten crisis uh, uh, that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to start actually with a BASF. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a visit by 280 teachers uh, who made it to the factory in uh, mid-December 1951. Um, um, BASF, of course, is, is uh, even today one of the largest uh, chemical companies in Germany. Um, uh, at the time, in December 1951, it was uh, just about to re-emerge as um, the largest chemical, uh, as, as an independent corporation. Um, after the uh, dissolution of the IG Farben, uh, which probably everybody knows, the large um, industrial conglomerate of uh, chemical factories uh, that played such an infamous role in the Nazi period, uh, and of course is well known for its use of slave labors and for providing the gas uh, for the gas chambers in Auschwitz and elsewhere. Um, now the teachers uh, were not interested in Germany's recent Nazi past. Um, they were local members of um, the uh, German Teachers Union, the uh, Gewerkschaft Erziehung und Wissenschaft, uh, and they wanted to learn something about the economic environment in which their students grew up. Um, the leader of the local chapter, Hans Loschke, wrote an article about this visit later on, and he wrote that no school in our region can exist without contacts with uh, BASF. Uh, many dads of our students work for BASF and the proximity of the große Fabrik, the big or the great factory, is a topic in every class. Especially when students are about to graduate, because then most students seek jobs at BASF. Um, this was a period of high unemployment. Many kids grew up without a father and as a consequence of destruction and expulsion, uh, there was a dramatic lack of housing. Um, to work in the great factory uh, meant protection. Um, uh, Loschke uses the word Geborgenheit, the German word Geborgenheit, uh, especially if you were able to get into one of the factory housing units. Um, now I'm talking about this uh, visit because some of the questions that the teachers um, discussed after their trip to the factory are highly relevant for my topic. Uh, and these questions were, and I, I give you the um, German quote here and, and I'll translate it into English, um, can modern man live beyond technology and retorts? Does a non-technical man still have the right to exist? Is there a tension between functionality and the human soul? What can be done to deal with the disharmony in the life of the modern industrial worker? And finally, can we build a new Volksgemeinschaft, national community, based on the experience of the Betriebsgemeinschaft, the company community? Um, now, the article on this visit was uh, published in the company newspaper, I showed you a picture of it, um, which at the time was mostly read by the um, roughly 26,000 employees who worked at BASF in, in Ludwigshafen, which is right in the center of, um, of, of Germany, close to Mannheim, Frankfurt, that kind of area. Um, now, um, the topics of this um, article, um, all these questions, they would, have, they would not have surprised anybody uh, who read the uh, newspaper re uh, regularly. Uh, the relationship between man and technology, uh, the question of the soul of the individual in the world of modern work, um, the new social organization of companies, uh, and the relationship between companies and societies, these were constant topics of the paper. Uh, among its writers were well-known um, company doctors, experts for human relations, but also quite prominent people like the uh, conservative philosopher and sociologist Arnold Gehlen. Um, Moreover, um, it was no surprise that um, uh, the author um, used Nazi vocabulary like Volksgemeinschaft without hesitation or regret, or regret. These words still seemed like pretty normal terms, even for a union leader like Hans Loschke, who had lost his job in 1933 uh, and was by no means a Nazi. Um, in fact, the, um, it's exactly this combination of, of Nazi vocabulary uh, and debates about the future and the meaning and the nature of work 
um, that define, uh, uh, defines the discourses about work in the early 1950s about which I'm uh, to talk about. Now, um, I was going to say a little bit about the context of, of, of this talk and about my current book. Uh, book. Um, basically, you've already explained a lot about it. Um, suffice it to say that the book combi uh, combines two um, approaches. On the one hand, it um, um, wants to be an intellectual history on, on discourses about work in West Germany, um, roughly from 1945 till about the end of the 1980s. Uh, and on the other hand, it follows a, a kind of history from below approach and uses shop floor analysis um, uh, to cover to uncover attitudes and values that uh, what I call define work and practice, um, uh, roughly in the same period, of course. Um, <clears throat> now, um, just just one further remark, um, sort of on definitions. When I um, talk about work, I'm mostly talking about Erwerbsarbeit, gainful employment. Um, and of course that's a very problematic term if we talk about work um, then uh, because there are many kinds of, of activities in which people produce things uh, provide necessary services um, that are not paid or which have tra traditionally not been seen as, as part of a work respective gainful employment uh, and the most important example of this kind of excluded work uh, is of course fem female work in the, fam uh, in the family um, so, so one of my uh, guiding questions in, in the book is always uh, how gainful employment was defined at a certain period, uh, which activities were excluded from that term, who was supposed to work and who not. Um, now, today I'm going to talk about the early 1950s, um, roughly the period between 1948 and 1954, um, so the, uh, the period of the foundation and the very early period of the Federal Republic. Uh, and when I talk about these years, uh, I mostly want to show you how this period is related to current debates about the historical caesuras um, that historians talk about when they talk about the 1970s and 1980s. Um, I want to explain why this period of the uh, Gründungskrise or foundational crisis um, is so central to my book. Um, I assume that most of you will be um, well familiar with the um, um, current debate on the structural break after the economic boom of the immediate post-war period. Uh, books with the title after the uh, boom after the boom have, have, have come out uh, frequently in the, uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so, so many German historians today argue that um, contemporary history or um, the prehistory of the present doesn't really start until after the uh, fundamental social changes of the 1970s. Uh, and in this interpretation, um, the notion of a fundamental change of work, um, mostly associated with a change from industrial to post-industrial society, um, uh, and a quite dramatic change in values. Um, some people talk about a silent revolution of values, uh, uh, most famously, of course, Ronald Engelhardt. In German, the term is Wertewandel. Um, all these uh, fundamental changes play a major role there. Now, I want to argue that we can only understand debates about value change uh, and about the change of the German work society, or even the disappearance of the German work ethic in the 1970s and 80s, if we connect them to discourses about work in the early Federal Republic. Um, I believe there is no radical caesura in the 1970s, but rather a constant debate about the nature of work and the right way to do work. And if you look to the 1950s, I believe we can already see the beginnings, for instance, of the most important change with regard to work in the 20th century, uh, namely the changing attitude towards women's work. Um, on the other hand, a look to the 1950s also reveals several important continuities in German debates about work, um, notions of the meaning of Beruf, uh, the vocational character of work, the idea of quality work, um, uh, all ideas that are still closely connected to the concept of work in Germany today. And I'll, talk, uh, I'll, I'll divide my talk into uh, four parts. Uh, the first thing, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, work in the 1950s and how it's perceived and how the relationship to sort of the, the, the current debates uh, is. Then I'll talk about um, what I call the forget forgotten crisis, unemployment and debates on the future of work. I'll briefly touch on, on an issue relating uh, women's work, uh, the campaign against double earners in the 1950s. And finally, I'll talk about the uh, crisis of the Beruf. Um, and the question of a, of a reinvention of work after the Nazi period um, will pop up basically in all four of these um, areas. Um, so let's um, move on to uh, work in the economic miracle. Um, one of the key topics of my book is a critique um, 
and a historicization of the idea of a fundamental value change in the 1970s. Um, this Wertewandel value change had been detected by sociologists and pollsters in the early 1970s. Uh, and um, after 1975, there was a huge public debate in West Germany about the nature of this change. Um, and questions of work, and especially the uh, question of the decline of a traditional work ethic, were one of the uh, central aspects of this uh, debate. Um, there were others. Um, people were talking about a uh, change of family values, uh, a shift in what was seen as, as essential in education, and of course uh, sexual values, the sexual revolution so it was a big topic at the time. Um, but um, the question of the work ethic was really quite central, um, and actually at the beginning of the huge public debate about value change. Um, social scientists reported a sudden change, a cycle revolution, as Ronald Ingelhardt put it, uh, and he claimed that within a few years, traditional, what he called material values, had been replaced by so-called post-material values. And the most telling example was indeed the new attitude towards work among the younger generation. Young people did no longer work, want to work or to work hard in the sense of traditional, well, now comes a German term that's hard to translate, bürgerliche Arbeitsethik. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, 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 um, uh, bourgeois middle class work ethic, but it's usually used in the sense of, of dominant ideas about hard work, uh, the centrality of work in life. Uh, it's also closely related to um, notions of a traditional Protestant work ethic uh, and a, spe a specific German sense of work. Now, um, these uh, post-materialists that um, the, the Poles was detected seem to see work in a completely different way than their materialist parents. For them, work was no longer required to give life a purpose, and it seemed no longer connected to notions of duty, to an idea of high performance and achievement. Uh, and basically, they, they, they um, left behind them the very basic idea that people find personal fulfillment in their work. Uh, and of course, again, you can hear a lot of uh, very hard to translate German terms uh, uh, behind these terms that are just used. The Leistungsbereitschaft, Pflichtbewusstsein, Erfüllung, Arbeitsfreude. Uh, that's all connected to this uh, bourgeois work ethic that I've been talking about. Um, now, for the uh, post materialists, at most, work could be um, part of a lifestyle that was looking for emancipation or individual self fulfillment. And that was possible if work allowed for participation, for creativity, and for individual development. Um, if, if, if those elements were there, then work was still important. But work was no longer seen as an uh, end in itself and as a fundamental element of personal identity. And on the contrary, leisure, the time spent not at work, gained importance in the life of the individual at the time. Uh, and especially if work was seen as strictly regulated um, and as part of a high, highly hierarchical uh, organization. I mean, there's a, there's a fundamental critique against Fordist uh, uh, company structures here, against Fordism and in, in, in a classic hierarchical industrial organization. Um, this kind of work, this kind of traditional factory work was seen as meaningless or at best as a nece necessary but unwelcome part of one's real life. Um, now, at the time, this was nothing that uh, everybody found bad. A lot of people actually welcomed this change, um, and uh, it could even be celebrated as an important step towards a more liberal and de democratic future. Um, most important is that there were very, very few people who um, would not have accepted that this change was real, that there was a value change and that it was going on. Uh, and indeed, most historians today agree with this perception. If you go to the textbooks, you always find value change, and usually the um, historians uh, cite the, the polls from the 1970s to illustrate the, uh, this fundamental change in the 1970s. Um, now, if you look at the 1950s uh, and the decades of the economic miracle, um, they play a very important role in this um, kind of master narrative of liberalization and change. Um, they embody the heydays of a specific German work ethic, that was seen as essential for the economic reconstruction of Germany after World War II. And I'll, um, I'd like to illustrate that with, a, with an article from the London Times. Um, uh, it was written in, in May 1984 by uh, the then correspondent in Berlin uh, and Bonn, Michael Binion, uh, who uh, described fundamental changes in Germany in the 1980s uh, and titled his article, Germany, Enter the Leisure Ethic. Um, uh, the picture really tells it all. I'll have it in, uh, in a larger format as well. Um, the article showed a photo of rebel women, Trümmerfrauen, that was taken in 1945. 
next to a beach on the Spanish Isle of Ibiza in 1984. Uh, and the claim was, of course, that today young Germans clearly prefer the beach to the factory or to hard work. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no longer um, did Germans believe in the work, uh, in work for the sake of work. They wanted more spare time, they wanted improved working conditions, uh, and they were looking for new ways of combining life and work. Uh, in his article, Binion talked about uh, the wave of strikes uh, that was uh, going on in 1984 for a 35-hour uh, week uh, work week, uh, but also about the emergence of the Green Party, uh, about the uh, sort of culture of the new German alternative movement, uh, and also about a rapidly growing unemployment uh, rate and, and uh, technological sh change. He was talking about computers and automation, uh, and generally he tried to explain um, why there was a decline of the traditional German work ethic. So, um, in this perspective, the 1950s were the period of, a traditional, uh, of, of traditional work values. Uh, and most historians today would probably agree, because this is finally the, uh, the, the classic master narrative of German recovery. Within the chaos of total war destruction, Germans started to rebuild their country in 1945, uh, very often they work with bare hands and, at least initially, no hope for the future. Um, by 1950 already, West Germans were um, talking about an economic miracle and uh, because they were so ardent in their work ethic, um, they have many reasons to be proud about their uh, sort of uh, progress that they've made after 1945. Many still lived in scarcity and rebel, but they were already moving towards new levels of consumption and the prospect of regained luxuries only um, added to their zeal to perform. Um, if you look at contemporary sources, it is fairly easy to find evidence for such attitudes. Um, many people after the war called for a new industriousness. Many people invoked a sense of duty and uh, emphasized the need for hard work. Um, however, less known is that there were also huge debates about undeclared work, Schwarzarbeit, uh, and many companies at the time complained about a lack of productivity in the immediate post-war years. Um, on the other hand of the spectrum, intellectuals like Walter Diers and uh, Dirks and Alexander Mitscherlich uh, soon started to argue that the post-war work mania was a way to repress notions of guilt and the need to deal with the Nazi past. Um, and of course, um, sometimes this work ethic was also used um, um, uh, in political debates. Um, for instance, I found trade unions in the 19, late 1940s who opposed the removal of industrial machinery by the Allied powers with the claim that they knew that Germans had to work and work and work in order to make up for their crimes. But because they had to work so hard, that was exactly the reason why no machines should be removed. Because then they wouldn't have been, uh, would no longer be able to work so hard. Um, Still, if you look at contemporary polls from the 1950s, um, they usually show that a majority of Germans did identify with ideals of hard work, um, economic efficiency, and personal ambition. Um, and many economic historians um, indeed point to the special industriousness and ambition of the many refugees and expellees in West Germany uh, when they try to explain um, the economic miracle. And yes, this is not all necessarily wrong. But I will now try to show that there is a lot more to be said about work in the early 1950s um, than that the experience of scarcity and the need for reconstruction uh, was kind of reflected in an even stronger traditional German work ethic. Um, so let's move on to the um, forgotten crisis. Um, yeah, hang on, that's the next slide. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, my talk about unemployment and, and the debates on the future of work in the early 1950s. Um, in the midst of the early reconstruction um, period, many people in West Germany were indeed debating about the meaning of work and the right attitude towards work. Um, and to some extent this was an elite debate. Um, many statements came from intellectuals, from politicians, from church leaders. Um, but um, there was also considerable debate within companies and on a shop floor level, often involving ordinary factories, uh, factory and office workers. Um, and fundamental questions of this debate were uh, what role should work, should labor play in a democratic society? What future does human work have in a world of rationalization and technological progress? And how were individuals supposed to deal with the fundamental changes in the realm of work through technology? 
those were the questions of the teachers, remember, that we had in the, uh, uh, the first example from 1951. Um, it's important to remember that the uh, contemporaries who um, engaged in this debate faced enormous economic hardships. In the winter of 1951-52, so just when the teacher union in Ludwigshafen visited the BASF works, um, post-war unemployment figures were very high. Early in 1952, more than 2 million West Germans were unemployed, and the figures had been growing for a while. Um, rising unemployment um, basically had become an issue shortly after the currency reform and the introduction of the Deutschmark in June 1948. Uh, and already in 1949, the 2 million threshold had been reached for the first time. And it was really not till um, the summer of 1952 that the number of unemployed uh, people dropped below 1.5 million um, for a significant time. Uh, and then this um, goes on, at least in every winter, till 1956. In each winter, uh, we have more than 2 million West Germans who are unemployed. Um, and um, uh, it's really only after 1956 that uh, sort of uh, unemployment really disappears from, from West Germany. Um, the West German public was well aware that these figures were not necessarily a direct reflection of an economic crisis. Um, Many people looking for work were refugees or expellees who had come to West Germany after the war. Um, and uh, many of them had ended up in rural areas without significant industrial fa uh, facilities, industrial production um, areas. Uh, and therefore, the um, most rural areas of Germany were the ones with the highest unemployment rates. Um, I, quoted, uh, I put down Schleswig-Holstein, Lower Saxony, Bavaria. Uh, uh, Schleswig-Holstein, for instance, in, uh, in 1951 had, uh, had on average more than 25% unemployment uh, uh, in, that, in, in that year. Um, um, other uh, states in, uh, in, in Germany had, had uh, pretty much no unemployment. Baden-Württemberg, for instance, at the same time reported full employment. Um, moreover, um, the number of people in jobs had gone up. Um, and uh, after the summer of 1950, uh, the West German economy had started to grow. Um, but still, um, federal unemployment rates of more than 11% led to nervous debates about necessary economic consequences uh, and gave uh, uh, the labor movement and, and the political left an opportunity to uh, uh, protest against the failure of the new social market economy uh, and the fate of the, few, of the millions of people who were on the streets. Now, I call this um, unemployment crisis of the early 1950s a largely forgotten crisis. Um, um, there are some um, studies on the uh, so-called Gründungskrise, foundational crisis, uh, but mass unemployment, poverty, and harsh conflicts about the basic values of society are not usually part of our picture of the early federal republic. If you look to, uh, uh, in, in, in history textbooks today, then they usually talk about the dire scarcity of the immediate post-war period, um, then they jump to the currency reform, uh, and after that you have the economic miracle, the full employment, rising consumption, a kind of new boom mentality. Um, however, um, I would claim that in the early 1950s, people in West Germany didn't know about this wonderful future boom. Um, and especially during um, what we could call the winters of unemployment, uh, their future could look pretty bleak indeed. Um, and this is one reason why, um, for example, um, the conflicts about workers' co-determination um, in 1952 escalated in the early summer. Uh, we have mass demonstrations by trade unions in all major West German cities at the time. Um, and uh, if you look at the number of the people on the streets protesting at the time, uh, we easily count uh, uh, people in the low millions. Uh, two years later, um, 1954, the year of the famous miracle of Bern, uh, the first time the German uh, soccer national team won the World Cup, um, uh, and, and this obviously uh, created a huge wave of national excitement. But just a few weeks later, West Germany was faced by a week-long wave of uh, very hard-fought strikes, um, most famously the so-called Bayern strike, uh, which was a six-week strike in the Bavarian metalworking industry uh, in, in the fall, early, late summer, early fall of 1954. Um, and at the same time, there was a huge debate about unemployment figures. Um, if, if, if you go through the press at the time, new figures were carefully noted every month. Uh, it was full of reports about political debates and how to deal with the problem. 
Um, and what I found most interesting is that most of the articles don't focus so much on the immediate economic hardships um, that are connected with unemployment, but um, more with a kind of concern for um, the psychological effects of, uh, of unemployment. Um, the argument was always people without work lacked meaning in their lives, they faced hopelessness, uh, and they saw the prospect of a kind of never-ending misery. Uh, and a typical example of such articles would be reports on uh, sort of long lines at job centers, uh, which would then tell uh, personal stories about the workers on the dole. Um, uh, also very common were kind of expressions of disbelief. Um, how could there be unemployment at a time in which uh, work seemed to literally be lying on the streets uh, in the form of rebel from, from, from wartime destruction or, or if in the form of destroyed houses that had to be rebuilt? Um, a very common point in, in this debate on unemployment was a comparison um, of the current crisis in the early 50s with the Great Depression and the Nazi rise to power in the early 1930s. Um, if you go through the press from 1949 till well into 1952, there were constant um, warnings um, against a political radicalization, both from the left and the right. Um, contemporaries were concerned about the stability of the new Federal Republic and its constitutional structures. Um, but actually they were kind of aiming at something even deeper, a kind of fundamental concern about um, the future of Germany and the ability of Germans to create a true democracy a moral and just society, which stood in sharp contrast to the moral failure of the Third Reich. And work was seen as, a, as an essential element in this attempt to build a new Germany. Um, and then unemployment was kind of the national catastrophe because it robbed Germans the chance of a meaningful new beginning. Um, and a typical way of expressing this was, uh, for instance, a statement like um, something that I found in, in, in some of the uh, union uh, uh, papers at the time, every cultural nation has the duty to safeguard its citizens from unemployment. Um, this idea of, of employment and work as a national task and a duty was also linked to a specific German way of work. Um, time and again commentators all over the political spectrum would um, emphasize that unemployment hit Germans harder than any other nation. Um, because um, Germans were particularly prone to hard work and that Germans, Germans could simply not exist without work. So unemployment um, led to kind of fundamental debates about the role of work in society and how work had to be organized to serve the nation, to serve democracy and the individual at the same time. Um, one central um, motive of this um, um, <coughs> of these debates was uh, a slogan that, that um, most of you have probably heard before, if you've done some research on Germany, because it's still used today sometimes, uh, the slogan about the Mensch in Mittelpunkt. Um, we need to put people, man, the human being, into the center of our economy, center of our companies, center of our daily work experience. Um, everybody who talked about employment and the reorganization of um, the economy talked about the importance of the human dimension of work in the early 1950s. Um, it became a central reference point um, for politicians, for employers, but also for church leaders and even for trade unionists. Um, it's really, really hard to exaggerate the ubiquity of, of this slogan. Um, it was absolutely used by everybody in the years around 1950. And it was kind of the central value statement on all debates, uh, in all debates on reconstruction, on unemployment and the future of work. We need to put man in the center. We mustn't be mentioned in the middle push. Um, now, um, there has been um, some research on this slogan, um, and, and previous research has mostly focused on one group in particular. Um, the mentioned middle point was also the key phrase used by a new group of uh, psychological experts within companies who introduced new psychological methods in training uh, and developing workforces, and who set up um, new kinds of human relation departments in major companies at the time. Um, and uh, in the context of, of their activities, um, the slogan um, um, actually went back to the debates on rationalization in the Weimar Republic. That's mm -hmm. when it was when it was first uh, used. Um, it was later appropriated by Nazi experts on rationalization uh, after 1933. Uh, but it took till the late 1940s and 1850s until pretty much the same people who had used um, this slogan between 1933 and 1945 
were able to establish it as a central program for a democratic reconstruction of the economy and society at large. Um, now, in the early Federal Republic, der Mensch im Mittelpunkt was understood as, an, uh, understood as an explicit rejection of Nazi ideology and as a rediscovery of the rights of the individual in, the, in their work life. Um, work should allow every employee to serve the nation, to be part of a work community, and then this kind of people, the Nazis used to, sh to, to talk about the, uh, the Betriebsgemeinschaft. Um, in the 1950s, they speak about the Werksgemeinschaft, but it's very, very similar, very close, and you can really see how there is a continuity uh, in these debates. Uh, uh, the uh, Werksfamilie is a very important term that, that's often used. Um, <coughs> um, so, um, um, so, so, so kind of um, uh, cooperative, a kind of communal aspect of, of this, this new sort of human dimension, but um, they also wanted that, that everybody was able to develop his or her personality through work. Um, and this, this new idea um, uh, was essential for a change of management structures and of management culture in, Germany, in German companies after, after the war. Um, and I'm sure you're, you're well familiar with, uh, with the debate among the economic historians um, to which extent this kind of uh, cultural change in, 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 in management culture uh, uh, was, uh, was, was, was uh, a consequence of Americanization of the German economy or to which extent it followed uh, sort, of, uh, sort of homebred German traditions. Um, uh, but overall, um, most historians have seen this, this slogan and, and, and the ideology behind it as a, as, a, as a kind of mantra that fed into the general conservative tendencies of the period. Um, uh, and it was usually connected with, uh, sort of as, as seen as something that was an important idea in debates on organizational theory and on management structures. Um, however, if we actually looked on uh, sort of shop floor um, uh, uh, activities, if we look to debates within companies, then we uh, soon find out that uh, the slogan was actually also used by labor leaders and by socialist politicians, and, and funnily in West and East Germany. Um, and that, that's one of the big ironies. This is the big slogan of sort of West German conservatives, but the, uh, uh, the, one, the one group of political leaders that are really always talking about the Menschen Mittelpunkt are the East uh, Berlin uh, mm -hmm. communist leaders and uh, it's actually uh, in the late 1960s when the GDR, uh, GDR gets a new uh, constitution uh, they include their mention Mittelpunkt as the fundamental principle of the socialist um, economy. Um, so, so it's uh, going on in, in both um, sides of the country at the same time, east and west, uh, and, and, and nobody seems to notice that mm -hmm. they're talking about the same thing. That's an interesting thing but not super central now. Um, in West Germany, um, the slogan played a special role in uh, negotiations between labor representatives and employers, um, especially if you go to a shop floor level. Um, it was frequently used both by managers and unionists in order to make claims or to mobilize the workforce. Uh, managers, for instance, could um, talk about the Mensch im Mittelpunkt in order to invoke the human community within a factory in a very um, patriarchal sense. Um, and on the other hand, labor leaders would talk about the Mensch in Mittelpunkt when they um, criticized company decisions or when they called for improved working conditions. Uh, and this really goes on from the late 40s throughout the, the 1950s. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, factory assemblies, uh, labor leaders always invoke this, uh, this slogan. And sometimes you have the manager talking to the, to the, to the assembled workers, uh, and then they kind of argue what, what Mensch in Mittelpunkt really means. Um, <coughs> So everybody who used this was uh, talking about the relationship between the individual and the larger community. Uh, and um, uh, I would argue that debates about the Mensch and Mittelpunkt um, kind of centered on the question of personal development, um, the need for independent characters and a kind of good mixture of self-determination uh, and a responsibility for the whole. Uh, and just like with the debates about unemployment, um, the question of the human dimension of work uh, and work organization was always linked to a deep sense of crisis. Uh, and this is related to the third aspect that I'm going to talk about, uh, the relationship between man and modernity, or technology and the modern individual <coughs> that everybody was talking about in this period. Um, now again, to some extent, this was a highbrow discussion um, led by intellectuals, uh, people like Helmut Schelsky, Ahmed Geer, and um, theologians like Oswald von der Bräuning. But it's really interesting to see how often these questions were also discussed on a company level. 
Um, unions were teaching their functionaries about the debate, just as work councils referred to fundamental problems of modernity when they talked about rationalization. Um, uh, they were constantly complaining about an increasing work pace, uh, and then suddenly you have uh, labor uh, union, uh, uh, union leaders talk about the loss of soul in the modern economy. Um, uh, another example from, from, a factory comp uh, from a factory newspaper, uh, this time from MAN in Augsburg in December 1953. <clears throat> um, there, um, uh, the, uh, the editor wrote about the disease of our time, the chase through life. Uh, he talked about modern man, still full of unrest and anxiety, despite all technology. Um, and uh, another example from the BASF paper, um, they talked at the same time about materialism, nihilism, mass society, and the loss of individuality as signs of our time. Um, yeah, I skip a few examples. Albert Galen himself wrote in that factory paper by BASF, uh, Here's a quote, the alienated and one-sided existence in factory halls and offices leads to chronic aggressiveness and bad temper. Work has become less physical, at least no longer requires all human abilities. On top of that, it no longer offers spiritual fulfillment. Even the manual worker is caught in a highly specialized and soulless routine of mental work. And this all is included in, 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 in complaints about monoton uh, monotony and, 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 and things like that. Um, and again, this kind of language had a very long tradition. It refers back to debates on monotony and dehumanization as, as, as fundamental problems of industrialization. And we have these debates already in the early, uh, early 1920s. Um, but if we talk about work in the 1950s, um, we must not only talk about uh, a new work mania that was based on a traditional German work ethic and a call for industrialness, hard work, and a strong sense of duty. Um, because almost everybody who talked about work at the time expressed a fundamental concern about a crisis of work. And this crisis could be seen in the high levels of unemployment, in the dangers of technology and rationalization. Um, and um, people saw a kind of double task, both the abuse of work by national socialism and the dangers of modern society called for a defense of work as an activity that allowed for personal fulfillment and individuality. Um, there was really a belief that work had to be recreated as a sphere of meaning and activity in which the individual could show his personal skills. Um, nothing about work seemed unproblematic. Indeed, work was in danger, uh, and that was uh, basically the message of this debate in the foundational crisis. Um, yeah, I think I still have time. <laughs> um, let, let me briefly touch um, um, on, on one of the answers that, that people gave in, 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 in this debate. Um, unemployment and the insecurity of work demanded an immediate answer in the early 1950s. Um, and uh, this, this whole debate had a deep sense of urgency. Um, uh, many people wrote to the federal government um, and sent in their ideas about how to solve the employment crisis and how to reestablish a moral order of work. That's one of my uh, sources I've read well, a few hundred of letters that were collected at the Bundesarbeitsministerium uh, in which people from all over Germany and from all levels of society came up with ideas about how to battle unemployment. Um, and many writers um, at the time reflected on proposals that had been made in Parliament and other public forums. Um, and one of the better known of this was the call for uh, married women to stop working so that unemployed men could go back into, uh, get back into work. Um, in conservative uh, circles, this was seen as a kind of moral obligation, not only to the unemployed, um, but also to families and children. Um, and, and this is an example from a, from a Catholic church paper uh, in, early in the early 1950s from the uh, uh, Diocese of Cologne. Uh, uh, it was titled, uh, Is Mummy Not at Home? Uh, the employment, uh, he talks about the Berufstätigkeit of married women destroys marriage, and as it is extremely hostile to children, also the people and culture as a whole. It takes the soul out of the home, which no longer rewards the husband after a long day's work, no longer gives him strength for the next day, no longer serves as a warm nest for the children, no longer as a haven of protection and a last resort in the love of the mother. The woman betrays the best values of her life. She breaks all primordial ties, uh, ties which have been created by nature itself. All right. <laughs> Such attitudes uh, were not uncommon in West Germany at the time, and um, they certainly dominated within religious circles. Uh, and, uh, this is a Catholic source, but you would find it in Protestant circles as well. Um, 
Uh, and we know that um, even though trade unions and social democrats at the time campaigned for equal rights of women and uh, uh, especially equal rights in the workplace, uh, we have long, uh, historians have long shown that, that patriarchal ideas about gender relations were widespread among labor, labor leaders just as, as, as they are among conservatives. Uh, the best example is that unions usually fought for, for the breadwinner's wage that would allow working women to stay at home um, and, and uh, sort of a, a more um, sort of, uh, an example from, 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 from my sources would be work councils uh, as soon as they had to uh, sort of uh, uh, have a say in, in, in who was going to be sacked when a company was making people redundant, they would usually um, not hesitate to suggest that married women should uh, go first. Um, so most historians see the debate about women's work and, and uh, double earners, doppelverdiener, as a sign of the dominance of conservative values well into the 1960s. Um, and usually they talk about the sharp contrast between women's work in West Germany and the strong emphasis on, on female employment that we have in East Germany at the time. Now the um, letters um, um, written to um, uh, the Ministry of Labour at the time suggest a slightly more complicated story. Um, many of the uh, complaints against double earners in these letters did not um, necessarily single out women um, as the only ones who simply worked for luxury and extra income. That was always the big, um, the big problem. Uh, to work for luxury and extra income is not acceptable as long as many people were unemployed and on the streets. Um, now besides married women there were many other um, double earners um, that were sort of uh, attacked in the letters. Uh, seniors who kept working even though they received retirement payments, sons of farmers who worked in factories and also helped on the farm, um, everybody who engaged in unreported work and received unemployment benefits at the time, and, and, and you could go on and on, they, they really come up, uh, they're quite creative about who else is, is a double earner. Um, in their official answers to these uh, letter writers, uh, every letter received a, 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 an answer by the uh, ministry's officials, um, these officials had a pretty hard time to, to deal with these different categories. Uh, and usually um, their solution was to, 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 to write a kind of standard letter in which um, they first talked about the employment of married women and then um, uh, about the, uh, the problem of working seniors, which was seen as, as, as uh, equally important by, by many of the writers. Um, <clears throat> um, they also had a hard time to come up with a clear distinction between double earners and unreported work, Schwarzarbeit, uh, because they wanted to take legal measures against the Schwarzarbeit, um, but they always defended the principal right to work of everybody when, when it came to double, double earners. Um, um, so the uh, debate about double earners, Doppelverdiener, was this not solely about women, um, but it had a kind of uh, slightly different touch to it. it. It aimed more generally at a fair distribution of work to everybody who needed employment at the time. And in this perspective, unmarried women and single mothers were not only allowed to work, but some letter writers even called for a priority of job-seeking single women because they needed protection on a very competitive uh, job market. Um, so I believe that the fact that many uh, writers were more concerned about a fair distribution of jobs and income than about the immorality of working married women, um, uh, this goes some way to explain why the overall conservative atmosphere did not really lead to a significant change in the development of female employment um, in this period. Um, many women who had found employment during the war and in the immediate post-war years did not stop to work in the um, 1950s. And if you look at the early 1960s, uh, we have roughly 9.5 million uh, women who were counted as, as, as in gainful employment, and that's about 1.5 million more than 10 years earlier. Um, to some extent, this was uh, the result of sheer necessity. Um, many West German families simply couldn't exist on a single income. Um, and there are clear sign that, signs that at least many unskilled female workers would have preferred to stop working right away. Um, but on the other hand, it seems as um, if among women in the 1950s there was no longer any need to defend employment. Um, only hard manual labor in factories was despised by many women, uh, but many skilled female workers and women with higher qualifications saw no longer any need to justify their careers. Uh, and most importantly, there's abundant evidence that more and more mothers stayed on the job in order to allow their, uh, allow their daughters to win better professional qualifications. Um, so, um, from the um, 1950s on, there's a clear contradiction between um, dominant value statements about women's work and the social practice of female employment, which 
continue to grow despite conservative objections at the time. Um, and I would say that the broad debates about work, unemployment, double earners um, actually furthered an already existing trend towards growing female employment. Um, I would say the Nazi period had seen a similar divergence between an open ideological hostility towards working women and a de facto increase of the employment rate amongst women. Um, women, uh, women who talk to historians about their work experience during the final years of the war um, always emphasized um, the sense of empowerment and economic independence that came with employment. Uh, and it seems that this experience was more important than the public reiteration of traditional gender notions. Um, overall, the 1950s show a double continuity. On the one hand, we have um, conservative gender stereotypes and hostility to female employment, which continue to dominate on a discursive level. And on the other hand, we have a strong trend towards female employment, which continued as well. Uh, and I would argue that this long-term tension created kind of the fundamental change in our view of gender and, and, and work uh, that we see later in the, in the 20th century. As I said before, I believe that this, this is actually the most fundamental change in attitudes towards work in the 20th century. Um, one final point. Um, and this is about the wonderful German word Beruf. Um, <laughs> Now, if you check the dictionary, you get at least five English translations. Uh, occupation, job, career, vocation, profession. So it's, it's really hard to translate this. Um, I, I assume that most of you are, are familiar with the kind of uh, German system of job training and apprenticeships. Um, therefore, I'm not going to say very much about this. Um, um, important is that by the early 1950s, um, the system faced um, basically two severe problems. Uh, and they were widely debated under the headline Berufsnot, um, literally uh, translates as, as vocational emergency. Uh, and the first problem was that um, they had very high unemployment rates uh, under, uh, among uh, uh, young people. Uh, there were simply not enough positions for apprentices. Um, uh, that had some demographic uh, reason. Uh, in the five years before the beginning of the World War, uh, Germany had seen a baby boom, and now in the early 50s, all these baby boomers from the pre-war period uh, were uh, f finished school and uh, were looking for, for jobs, uh, and they just couldn't find enough. Um, uh, the second problem, uh, problem went, went deeper and concerned the future of job training and vocations in general. Um, there was a fundamental question whether there would still be Berufe if modern technology kept advancing and changing the relationship between man and machine. That goes back to the earlier debate that I, that I mentioned. Um, yeah, I'm trying to um, skip a little bit. Um, what we have um, um, in this period is, is, is uh, uh, Plenty of examples how, how people saw a sort of a fundamental problem, problem with vocation and, and, and this kind of this, this crisis of vocation or the, of, of, of the job of the of the occupation uh, was always um, um, linked to this fundamental problem of um, yeah, um, this fundamental problem of, 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 of how to solve the, the crisis of work. Um, um, yeah, I think I have to <laughs> have to skip a little bit. Um, let me let me just um, uh, uh, jump to my to my conclusion here. Um, basically, um, my talk was about um, uh, what I wanted to show in this talk was that the early years of the Federal Republic were a period in which um, many different um, um, sort of social agents in West Germany perceived a very fundamental crisis of work and a deep crisis of the vocational character of work. Um, and in their response, um, that goes back to, to the immediate response to this Berufskrise and Berufsnot, um, they put a lot of emphasis on the, um, uh, <coughs> on, the, uh, on the ideal of skilled work or vocational work. Uh, and I would say that this created a strong long-term effect that to some extent can even be felt today. Um, generally, the meaning of work and the question of how Germans should work was, highly, uh, was a highly contested field that was closely connected to the question of how to build a democratic society after 1945. Um, the lack of work and, and unemployment could threaten, a uh, uh, could threaten a repetition of the crisis of the late Weimar Republic. Um, and at the same time, Nazi ideals of work in the sense of a collective national effort for the Führer or the ideal of a strictly hierarchical works community were still around. And so were many managers, foremen, and technical experts, which had played a, ro a major role in the Nazi economy, 
uh, and who now try to reinvent themselves as economic leaders in a new area. So the major task was um, reconstruction, but also the re-establishment of a positive collective idea, uh, identity. And an uh, appeal to traditional notions of German work, on quality work, I didn't have time to talk about quality work, uh, and on the vocational pride of skilled workers uh, seemed absolutely necessary. And at the same time, um, the future of uh, work and the future of skilled workers appeared highly uncertain. Uh, so the big questions of the time were, uh, what was fair? What was productive in the realm of work? Which role were women supposed to play? What right did uh, unemployed male workers have? And if you look at these debates, the story of work in the 1950s, I believe, becomes much more nuanced and a much more complicated pattern of continuity and change emerges. Uh, and this is totally different from the uh, classical master narrative of an uh, economic miracle driven by a simple traditional German work ethic. Thank you very much.